It's been a whirlwind so far. We started the story with a relaxing walk through the streets of London. How did we end up here? A politician murdered, a scientist on his deathbed, and a murderer disappeared. We can only hope our worthy Mr Utterson can sift through the sordid details of this nightmare. Mr Enfield and Mr Utterson are on their usual Sunday walk when they decide to stop at the door where they first discussed Mr Hyde. They reminisce about those strange times, how they both felt inexplicably repulsed by Mr Hyde. Though they are both relieved Mr Hyde's gone, Mr Utterson still feels saddened by Dr Jekyll's continued absence. For old time's sake, Mr Utterson requests that they step into the court of Dr Jekyll's house to try to catch a glimpse of the reclusive scientist. After all, a visit from an old friend may relieve Dr Jekyll's mysterious suffering. Sure enough, there by the window sits Dr Jekyll. He admits he's feeling very low, but expects it won't last long. Mr Utterson suggests that he grab his hat and come outside to join them on their walk. But Dr Jekyll is not to be swayed. He does ask them to stick around to chat with him, though, which shows that he misses his friends. Suddenly, Dr Jekyll's welcoming smile disappears and is replaced by an expression of terror and despair. Dr Jekyll then slams the window shut and disappears. There's no denying it. They both saw it. The two men continue their walk in silence until Mr Utterson, with a look of horror, says a quiet but desperate prayer. Mr Enfield can only nod solemnly as they continue walking. One night, as Mr Utterson sits by his fireside, as usual, he receives a surprise knock at the door. It's Mr Poole, Dr Jekyll's butler, looking pale and shaken. Clearly, this was not a social visit. Something has happened. Mr Poole tells Mr Utterson that he has a bad feeling about Dr Jekyll being locked away all the time, like a really bad feeling. He wonders if perhaps Dr Jekyll has been murdered. Mr Utterson follows Mr Poole back to Dr Jekyll's residence. It's a wild, cold March night. The wind is howling and the streets are strangely empty. When they arrive, the servants let them in. To Mr Utterson's surprise, all the servants have gathered by the big fire in the hallway. Men and women, they are huddling like a flock of frightened sheep. A servant boy hands them a candle to light their way and Mr Utterson follows the old butler to the back garden. They pass through the laboratory and stop at the foot of a staircase. It leads to Dr Jekyll's private office on the first floor, where the door is firmly shut. Poole motions Utterson to stand aside and listen while he mounts the stairs to knock on the door. Poole tells whoever is inside that Mr Utterson is here to see him. A pained voice answers from within, refusing all visitors. Both men walk back to the great kitchen and Mr Poole asks the critical question. Was that his master's voice they just heard? Mr Utterson cannot deny it. The voice has changed. Mr Poole believes that the true Dr Jekyll has been murdered and an imposter has taken his place. He goes on to tell Mr Utterson about the imposter's strange behaviour. All week, that thing has been demanding some sort of medicine, writing desperate orders to all the chemists in town, and Mr Poole would be sent out multiple times a day to look for a particular drug. Then one day, when Mr Poole suddenly entered the laboratory from the garden, he saw a figure digging among the crates. When the creature looked up, startled, Poole saw that it was wearing a mask. It then cried out before fleeing back into Dr Jekyll's office. If it was truly Dr Jekyll, why would he be wearing a mask? And why did he run from his faithful butler of 20 years? Mr Utterson takes this all in and comes to a reasonable conclusion. Dr Jekyll must be suffering from a sickness that mangles his features. 
this would explain the mask, his avoidance of his friends, and his desperate search for a drug to aid his recovery. But Mr Poole has another detail to add. This mysterious figure could not have been Dr Jekyll. He is too short. Don't we know a mysteriously short-statured man who happens to be one of London's most wanted? Mr Poole can only come to one conclusion. Dr Jekyll has been murdered and the murderer is in his office. Mr Utterson now believes it's his duty to bust the office door down. As the two men arm themselves, Utterson warns Poole that they're about to place themselves in mortal peril. But Poole is all in now, just as Utterson is. But first, Utterson needs to know, did Mr Poole recognise the imposter? Mr Poole has a ready answer. He thinks it was Mr Hyde. He was the only other person with access to the laboratory door. Not only that, but he also moved like Mr Hyde and gave Poole that familiar sense of repulsion. There was something very wrong with Mr Hyde, something that made one's blood run cold. There is little left to say now. It's time to act. Mr Utterson calls Bradshaw, the footman, to come help them. The plan is simple but perilous. Utterson and Mr Poole are going to force their way into Dr Jekyll's office. Then, if the figure tries to escape, Bradshaw and the houseboy will intercept him. The footman and his young helper, armed with heavy sticks, leave for their posts. Meanwhile, Utterson and Poole set off by candlelight. When they reach the office door, they listen carefully to the sound of footsteps. They were light, uneven footsteps, unlike the heavy tread of Dr Jekyll's. Mr Poole reveals that the suspected Mr Hyde often paces to and fro like this. One day, he even heard him weeping like a lost soul. Sure that Bradshaw was in his position, Mr Poole grabs his axe and sets the candle on a nearby table. Now it's Mr Utterson's turn. He calls out for Dr Jekyll in a loud voice, demanding to see him. He threatens that if denied, he will knock down the door. The voice that calls back definitely isn't Dr Jekyll's. Utterson gives the word and Mr Poole swings his axe and the door crashes to the floor. A little shocked and dazed from the crash, Utterson and Poole allow their eyes to adjust to the darkness. There, in the middle of the floor, lies the body of a man still contorted and twitching. As they carefully draw nearer, the men confirm that it is indeed the dreaded Edward Hyde. Strangely, he is dressed in Dr Jekyll's clothes, too large for him. In his hand is a crushed vial that flavours the air with a strong smell, poison. Mr Hyde has killed himself. This just leaves the grim task of finding Dr Jekyll's body. Mr Poole and Mr Utterson search high and low throughout the building for the body, but they are forced to admit that there is nothing to find. Mr Poole thinks he must have been buried. Mr Utterson is more hopeful. Maybe he has simply run away. The men decide to take a closer look at the office. In it, there is evidence of chemical work, mainly some white salt being laid out on glass saucers. Mr Poole points out that these are the drugs that he was forever being sent to fetch. There are several books on a shelf, including a religious text, which Dr Jekyll had annotated with shocking blasphemies. When they inspect the business table, there is a large envelope bearing Mr Utterson's name. It's in Dr Jekyll's unmistakable handwriting. Utterson opens it to find Dr Jekyll's will and another document. The will states that Utterson will now inherit everything that Dr Jekyll had originally set aside for Mr Hyde. Perhaps Mr Hyde was so enraged by being replaced by Mr Utterson that he killed Dr Jekyll. Mr Utterson spots a brief note lying beside the will. It is in Dr Jekyll's handwriting, dated this very day. The men feel a surge of hope. He could not have been murdered and disposed of in so short a time. 
As for Mr Hyde, can it simply be declared a suicide? Do they have enough evidence to conclude this? Mr Poole looks at Mr Utterson expectantly. Why not read the note that's been left for him? Mr Utterson admits he is afraid, but plucks up the courage to begin reading. The note reads with a sad tone of finality. It declares that it will only have landed in Mr Utterson's hands if Dr Jekyll has, indeed, disappeared. It instructs Mr Utterson to read the letter that Dr Lanyon has written for him, then to read the confession enclosed with the will. Mr Poole then hands Utterson another bulky envelope. Mr Utterson solemnly puts it in his pocket. It's now ten o'clock at night and he'll return home to read all the documents. At midnight, he will return and call for the police. They leave, locking the door to the laboratory behind them. What horrors have we seen tonight? We started the story with a mystery, but now we're left with bodies and tell-all letters. Mr Utterson braces himself for the ugly truth. Stay tuned for the grand finale of the strangest tale you've ever heard. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.